Welcome to the Next Level Faith Podcast. I'm your host, Julianne Kirkland, best-selling author and life coach for ambitious women of faith. Join me each week to learn more about the strategies, tools, and mindset needed to arise from the overwhelm and create a joyful life you love. To learn how you can work with me further, grab your copy of my best-selling book, Arise and Shine, or check out how you can get your ticket to my next Await conference or retreat, head over to juliannekirkland.com. Also, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode because the best version of you begins on your next level of faith. This is the Call to Courage series. On today's episode, you'll hear from Morgan Hart as she answers the call to courage to be seen. Morgan is a believer, a tattooed pastor, a full-time worshiper, and a designer. Listen in and enjoy Morgan's story. Hey, hey, welcome back to the Next Level Faith Podcast. I'm your host, Julian Kirkland, and I'm so excited Morgan's here today. Hey, Morgan. Hi, guys. So happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I am so happy you're here. So, Morgan, you have such an incredible story of a really, like, mental health resilience, is which is kind of coming to mind right now. Um, so start to share that. Like, where... Where did you start with this journey and and what kind of, you know, progress as to where you are now and why you have such a heart with helping women and men break free from the stigma of shame? Yeah. So what's crazy is I, that we have no mental health, depression, anything that runs in our family. Cause normally you hear about that, that people it's generational. And so, um, I was a happy kid, a happy teenager, a happy young adult. Like I didn't have any like worries or anything. I mean, I was carefree and fun. And, and then, um, I think about, I had my three kids and my husband and I were campus pastors at a church and literally the day that I took over the children's pastor position at this church is when I started battling these things. I don't even know what to call them. Um, if you want to call them demons, if you want to call them, whatever you want to call them, Um, I started battling these things that just came out of nowhere. I mean, they literally hit me like a rock and, um, it was such a hard time in that, that first couple weeks I felt, so I'll give you a a little, it, it started with my health, my physical health, not my mental health. So I started feeling, um, chest pains and I started witnessing or experiencing like stomach pains issues, stuff that I had never really dealt with before. And I thought I was dying. Literally, I thought I was dying. And this was Thanksgiving time. And I can't remember the exact year I I could try to remember, but it would take me a while. But I remember going to a spin class and having to leave the spin class. I mean, this was the very first like account that I can remember of all this happening. And I was in a spin class with my aunt and we were just going along. And all of a sudden the room got very dark and started spinning. And so I had to get off the bike and lay down. And after that day, after Thanksgiving, the the course of the next couple of months was really living hell for me. I thought I was having heart attacks. I thought I was, um, I mean, I spent numerous nights in the ER, my husband, it, it was just, thankfully my parents live where we are. And so they were able to help out as much with the kids. Like I said, I had three children at the time. They were six, four, and two. So they were pretty young and multiple nights in the ER. And then about the new year time frame, I finally went back for one of the last times. And the doctor was like, Morgan, there's, you are perfectly healthy, physically, perfectly healthy. There's nothing wrong with your heart. Cause I wanted something to be wrong because right. that would explain everything. It would make sense. It would make sense. Wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted something to be wrong with me physically so that they could fix the problem. And so I remember sitting in the hospital bed after, I don't even know how many, this is probably like the fifth or sixth stress test that I've had. If you've never had a stress test, they're not fun. Nope. And, um, he's like, you're, you're perfectly healthy. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not. Something is wrong with me. I'm not quite sure what it is. And he pulled up a chair next to the bed and he sat down and he looked me straight in the eye and he said, there's nothing physically wrong with you. You are perfectly healthy. I think I was 32 at that point, Mm -hmm. 32 year old. And I said, well, what is wrong? And he said, you're experiencing panic attacks. And I was like, what the heck are those? I've never 
No, I mean, I've heard people talk about them. I've heard, you know, people of having them, but I'd not known what they really were. And he said, you are experiencing things in your body that make you feel like you're having a heart attack, but it's all coming from your mind. And I'm like, that's weird. Like, that doesn't even make sense to me. How is that possible? And he's like, it is, you need to go see a doctor because you're, as I've seen you, you're progressively, you know, you're getting worse. You're not getting any better. And so I remember being, my husband was in the military at that point, still in the Navy. And so we had TRICARE. And if you know anything about TRICARE, it's just really hard to, to, to get an appointment with, with somebody that's not inside TRICARE. So I go see my PCM, which is my primary care manager. And I tell her all, you know, you have to fill out that list of like circle the sad face. Right. And, all right. that silliness. <laughs> and so I, I mean, I mean, literally it was all sad faces. I was like, I'm going to be completely honest. This is how right. I'm feeling right now. And she came into the room and we talked and without even really getting to know me, she said, I want you to try this medicine. And I was like, and I'm not a medicine taker. I don't, I don't. I love functional medicine. I love trying to heal from the inside out. I don't want to put stuff in my body. And so, and I've always been that way. Like even with Tylenol, my Anthony gets so mad at me and I'm like, I want, I'm going to fight it. I'm going to lay down. (laughs) I'm going to drink the water. I'm not going to take this dang Tylenol. So, um, sometimes I have to obviously, but, (laughs) but I was so perturbed that she didn't even take the time to get to know me. She didn't even get to take the time to say, well, maybe we need to give you like a psyche vow or um, just go to a psychologist or a psychiatric, psychiatric, whatever. It's like, I can't even think of the word, but she, but none of that. She just literally wrote me out as prescription for, um, I can't remember the name of the medicine, but, and I remember going home defeated. I mean, I felt so defeated because the one person that I thought was going to be able to help me a little bit in this journey was her. And so I went home, took the med, took one pill and completely felt convicted on taking it. I don't know what it was about me, but I did not um, like the way it made me feel. And I'm like, I don't feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I literally dumped the medicine out and got rid of it and continued on this journey of just fighting it alone. I did. I felt completely alone and it, it progressively got worse obviously things get worse before they get better. And I remember, um, it, you know, the suicidal ideation turning into, um, complete, I lost 30 pounds in a month. I didn't get out of bed really at all. And again, thankful that my mother, she was a principal at the time. She took so many days off of work to come over and just take care of the children when Anthony couldn't and couldn't be there because of work because he was in the military at the time. And so, um, barely got out of bed. I wasn't a mom, a mother. I mean, but the funny thing is, is I was able to walk in on church on Sunday morning and nobody knew what was going on. I could play the part wow. very well. And wow. so, um, I mean, people knew that I was losing weight. That was about the only thing that they could, they, they could physically see. I'm that sure they me. were complimenting you on it. Too. Yeah, they were. And I'm like, well, it's not really happening for good reasons. <laughs> and so we, I remember it just, um, it was like February, March, and April, things just got really bad. And I remember my husband had to leave for a month. And so my mom, um, took off work the entire month to stay with me. I, maybe not the entire month, but she was there from my recollection a long time. And so, um, and during that for four weeks, things got really bad and it got to the point of not only was I, you know, envisioning of harming myself, I was envisioning of harming my family. That's how bad it got. So I knew something had to, had to break. And I remember my husband coming back from that trip and I, he was in the living room with the kids eating popcorn, watching a movie. And I was in the bathroom and I remember I had the water turned up high. I had worship music going and I was literally just sobbing and I found a razor. And so, and it was just straight razor because my husband used to shave. So I, it wasn't like attached to like a, you know, how we shave our legs. And I remember crawling on the bathroom floor, literally. And I so so funny because I still can like feel the coldness of the floor. And I remember, um, having that razor to my wrist 
Wow. And I, I mean, literally my family's in the next room. I can hear them. And I said, God, if you hear me right now, you need to intervene because I'm not the mother. I'm not the wife. I'm not the sister. I'm not the daughter, I'm not the pastor that you've called me to be. And really at that point, it wasn't about me selfishly wanting to end my life. It was me selfish, like for my family, they deserved so much better. This was six months of just horrendous, um, my kids having to watch their mother go through this. Thankfully, they don't really remember because they were so young, but I was just done with having to deal with what I was representing for my family. And at that moment, I mean, I was like, God, where the hell are you? If you are here and you are real, I need you to show up right now. And in that immediate moment, I will never forget it. He, um, I dropped the razor and I felt like this warmth, like this closeness hug over me. And I could hear him say, I see you. And I'm like, and I immediately just screamed and started sobbing and Anthony ran in and mind you, my husband knew I was going through things, but he did not know the extent of my thoughts and what was happening. Because I, I really thought that if I told somebody I would have been taken away and I would have rather ended my life than go away. Right. Um, because they're not, th- they're not your normal thoughts. Now, right. suicidal ideation, hurting yourself is not quote unquote normal, but when it comes to hurting your family, like mm-hmm. that is the next level that I was like, Oh my right. God, I tell anybody this, they're going to lock me away. Like I'm going right. to go away. And so, um, in that moment that I dropped the razor, began the healing process because I was able to, I started expressing how I was feeling Yeah, and I started opening up. And I mean, I, I mean, this was months of panic attacks, not sleep. I mean, I, I could go in and I could talk for hours about everything that I dealt with, but I will tell you one dream I had, and it was, um, not long after that razor bathroom, I call it my bathroom floor moment, not after long after that I had a dream And I was in this dark room and I don't tell this dream to a lot of people just because some people are like, that sounds crazy. (laughs) But, um, I was in this dark room and I could see this glow like far away and I could hear the voice of God telling me walk towards it. And so I started walking towards it and it looked scarier and scarier and scarier. And I was like, I don't want to walk anymore. And he's like, no, keep walking. So I kept walking towards it. And as I got closer, I noticed it was this, um, it looks like a demon, like curled up in a ball of flames. And so I walked over and, um, God literally said, go put your foot on top of it. And so I walked over, I put my foot on top of it. And he said, you will never have to deal with this demon again. And so, and then I woke up. I mean, oh, I've got all the, I know girl, (laughs) every time I tell it, I get, I get goosebumps. Um, because it was such a powerful moment because in that moment I woke up and I, I truly knew that it was a demon that I was battling. It was, and it, it wasn't something that was, I was going to have to deal with for the rest of my life. Now there are moments where the enemy still tries to get at me and I'm like, you knew, you know, God already told me that, but I truly felt that my calling in this life is to help women that have, that are going through it, that are still fighting because I understand, like, I know how it is to get to the lowest of the lows and literally the razor on my skin feeling of almost taking my life. And again, the shame and disappointment that I was afraid to tell even my husband, right? Because I didn't want anybody to think less. I was a pastor. Like I was right. You're like, God, I'm working for you. I know. I'm like, I should not be dealing with (laughs) Right. Yeah. So, but yeah. And so from then on, I, it took me years, honestly, before I could really tell my story without completely losing it and actually feeling those feelings again. Yeah. Um, and so it's been within the last couple of years that I can really actually talk about it without like emotionally breaking down and, (laughs) and sure. But yeah, it's just the journey I'm on now. And I feel like now, um, even over the past couple of months of stepping away from this business I was a part of, um, to really fully step into the calling of helping people and becoming more of a mental health advocate and, um, 
just stepping into more of what God is calling me to be. It was yeah. a wild journey, but oh man, <laughs> an amazing journey. Yeah. So what what would the Morgan now? Because here's what happens, right? So I work with a lot of, you know, like arising entrepreneurs that are wanting to start getting their message out there in the form yeah. of a business or speaking or, you know, writing a book or whatever. And and so often in that entrepreneur industry, right? We're told to like, okay create your blueprint, create your formula. And there's things such as this, yeah. <laughs> that there's not like, Oh, you take this step and then you take this step and then you take this step. And then, yeah. oh. so what would the Morgan now, if she were to go sit beside the Morgan on the bathroom floor, like what did the Morgan on the bathroom floor need to hear in that moment? Gosh, now you're going to make me get emotional. Um, I should have brought tissues. Um, it's okay. We can get snotty. It's fine. <laughs> I'm like, holy moly. I'm going to get crying over here. Uh, I think what she needed to hear at that moment is. I see you. Mm. You are worthy. You um, can fight this. Sorry, my dog. Um, just, I see you. Cause I felt like. I was so covered in this shadow of where nobody saw me. Um, and even though I was going through all these hardships and I didn't tell anybody, I'm like, how can nobody see the crap that I'm going through right now? Like, I know I'm not hiding it that well. Right. And I think sitting beside her, just letting her know that she is seen and loved and worthy and known, um, it's probably what I would tell her. And because all of those things I did not feel at all. Yeah. Yeah. It was not fun. That, that's so powerful. And, you know, for anybody who's listening right now and is experiencing that, that shame that does it, it hides us. I mean, God, think back to the garden, yeah. you know, that's why the enemy used shame like right away. <laughs> and and that, that amount of like feeling like we're in the shadow. Yeah. And so if you're listening right now and you are experiencing any form of that, like what Morgan just said, you are seeing, bring the light into it. You know, I remember a time um, after my dad died, I have quadruplets and it was really hard, like in that season of poop on the walls and like, oh. <laughs> yeah. you know, my dad died of Alzheimer's. And I remember being in the kitchen one day and I say, you know, I swirled around, but instead of like the super, super, not super woman, wonder woman spin, you know, where she comes out like wonder woman <laughs> as a superhero. I came out as the villain, right? Like I spun around so fast and I just like angrily yelled at my children. Um, just that such a hot temper. And I remember running into my closet and just like face planning on the floor. And I turned all the lights off. Cause I just felt like nobody was seeing me anyway, you know, and I just needed to get away. And it, I don't, in that, in that mind frame, you know, you feel like darkness is better. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that feels more comforting. And of course it does because it's the enemy messing with your mind. But I remember like laying on the floor in the darkness, but there was that beam of light that runs, you know, under where the door meets the floor. And I see these like chubby little fingers <laughs> start to work their way out from under the door. And it was just this like reminder. God just brought this revelation that like there is life. Oh, well, no, I'm getting emotion. There's life in the light. Yeah. You know, and it's just, do you see it? Cause it was always there. Yeah. But I was just so encompassed by the darkness and I wouldn't even say I was depressed or dealing with, you know, suicidal ideation or anything to that level mm -hmm. and still, and yeah. that's what I want you know, the listeners that are listening right now and be like, well, I don't think I would ever take a razor, but you don't know. No, you don't, <laughs> you don't know, no. you know, and just like what Morgan was saying at the beginning of her story, like she hadn't experienced that before. Yeah. It's, and that's what the thing is, it doesn't have to get to that point of su suicidal ideation. 
God does not want us to live in that state of being unhealthy mentally, physically, spiritually. And so anytime that you're feeling it, and it like my sister, she's dealt with depression and anxiety for years. And it's just, it, again, it doesn't run in our family, but there's something that she's dealing with and she's never gotten to that point of, you know, wanting to take her life. But I tell her all the time, I'm like, you are not meant to live this way. Like right. you right. are supposed to live in the freedom and of Christ. And yeah. he gives us grace and mercy every day. Like I, I pray every single day is you thank God for the breath in my chest and the beat. Nope. Yes. The breath in my chest and the beat. No, the breath in my lungs. Lord, I can't breathe. The breath in my lungs it's and the beat all in, in the chest. chest. And I say it every day. Um, the breath in my lungs and the beat in my chest, because yeah. I'm so grateful for every single day that I have. And, yeah. um, and we have to live in that state and it can be hard. And some people aren't grateful. Some people aren't happy where they are. And, um, it's just learning to, you know, beat that, the darkness, because that yeah. is what takes over and it can be, yeah. It can be scary. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in in your um, dream where you you stomped on the demon, my husband and I were watching the series, The Chosen. Mm -hmm. And um, it was when Mary Magdalene is like, she's in her mind already been cured, right? And she's out, she's with the other disciples and um, the stranger kind of walks into their camp who's possessed with a demon and, you know, Jesus comes upon them and yells, you know, get out or flee or whatever. And then the demon goes, but then it's like, Mary goes right back to where she came from, like literally walks back to where she came from. Um, and my, it brought this conversation up with my husband and I of like, it seemed so obvious then that it was a demon possession, mm-hmm. you know, now we've gotten so comfortable with um, mental wellness and the terminology that goes into all of that. And to your point, they can be one in the same, mm-hmm. you know, and that, that was my point to him. It was like, I was like, man, you just don't see demon possession as much anymore. And he was like, yes, you do everywhere. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a good point. <laughs> yes, it is. Just, we don't, we almost are afraid to, yeah. to claim that for what it is. Mm-hmm. And it's my husband. I talk about it all the time is, you know, even, I mean, they're even in the church. Like, I feel like the church has gotten so to the point now where they're so afraid to talk about demon possession and all that stuff that they're sitting right on the pews because you're not truly yeah. preaching, preaching what right. Jesus wants you to preach. And so I would say it's like this vision of like, um, Jesus is sitting on the back pew of every service. He's just sitting there and he's just waiting for that invitation to come. It's demon possession is everywhere. It just doesn't, you just don't, um, it's not like the Bible where, you know, they're into pigs and they're all that, you know, it's not that vivid, but it's everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. And it's, um, yeah. And again, like there you are in the church working for God (laughs) and it still happened to you, Yep. you know, and that's what people need to grasp is that you don't, you don't have to be what people would like to classify Mm -hmm. those who get possessed. Yeah. 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 It doesn't have to be one of those movie moments. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy because, and then, um, and I see it not even as so much as a possession, in some regard, it's almost just like an attachment. Yeah. Like they're just hanging on. They're there. They're there. They're not fully in because they haven't been allowed in. Right. Because I truly feel that if you carry God's spirit in you, right. You can't you fully be. Yeah. Right. So, but they can attach yourself, their selves to you. Um, because if you om- open that moment of weakness, they're, they're going to come in. And I always say the enemy is not smart but he is, uh, like a ninja. I always say (laughs) those right little holes to get in. Uh, And he deals in the same things every single time. Yeah. Yes. He doesn't have to even be clever about it. (laughs) He doesn't. (laughs) He doesn't. It's the same things, but we, you know, in this world, you get so caught up and it happens before you even realize it. 
Yeah. Something that, you know, you also said with Jesus is in the back pew and um, the conversation I've been having with a lot of women lately is um, this, this trend, I guess I'll call it of Mm -hmm. a lot of pastors and preachers and teachers and um, just trying to add so much to God's word, yeah, you know, to like flamboyant it <laughs> almost, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah, his word is so enough. It, it you can't enough. add to it. No. And I always say, uh, if, and I'll say this to my con- our congregation all the time, because sometimes I feel like they it's based on works and how much they can do. And I'm like, honestly, if, if Jesus, the only thing he ever did for us was die on that cross, that's enough. Mm-hmm. Like there's no need to add anything else to it. Now, what he did afterwards, obviously is amazing, but that was enough. And there's no need to, like you said, add the fluff and the stuff right. to the word, because it's so it's simple. If you make it simple and there's people that make it really hard. And that's wow. like in our congreg our church, we don't, we're, we don't fall under a denomination yeah. because people are like, well, what are, we're, we're Jesus followers. We're Christ right. followers. Don't put me in a box. <laughs> no, don't. I don't want all these stipulations of right. what this denomination believes, how you can get like, right. no, we literally go by the word of God and yeah. not man-made things. And so it's, that's really hard for people to grasp because they're, people are so used to churches being under these coverings. And I mean, we have a covering that we're under and they're amazing. Um, They do fall under a denomination, but they don't dictate what we do. Yeah. And so um, that's what I love about our our congregation. And we've learned so much over the years of pastoring. We've been pastoring for either lead pastor or campus pastors for almost 15 plus years. And so it's been this journey of truly diving into God's word in a different way than we ever have and teaching the people that are part of our family to do it for themselves and not just take what comes out on Sunday morning. And it's been a journey of, we walked into a very hurt environment Mm -hmm. and we took over very hurt people. And so building that foundation has taken, we're four years in and I still feel like we're we're almost there of like building that trust and that culture shift of what happened to the people in that congregation before we came. And so it's been really wild because we have this old rundown. I mean, the building is beautiful. It's just old. Sure. And it needs a lot of work and it doesn't look, doesn't represent us. Well, people don't expect to see the people that they walk in when they walk. I'll just put it that way. I'll have to send you a picture, but, um, but that like God, we walked in and God's like, don't even worry about the structure. Like you need to fix the foundation, not the physical foundation, but the relationship, the spiritual right. of the spirit. actual church, which is the, of people. the actual <laughs> church. That's right. And we're seeing things grow now and like things are happening with the building and we're progressing in certain ways, but it's just being in that obedience. I would say obedience is better than sacrifice. And that is, it's in Samuel. Anthony and I were talking about the other day, Samuel something. Um, I was like, oh, I, I love tattoos. Obviously I was like, I'm going to get that scripture tattooed somewhere that I can see it yeah. because it truly is being obedient is so much better than sacrificing. Obviously we have to sacrifice in our walk, but right. when you're obedient, it just comes. It's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it goes back to that you know, it's so interesting when people say easy, because I think, again, as a society, we have formed our own narrative around what easy should be. Yeah. And it's like, that's not it. There's Mm -hmm. an ease to it. And there's a simplicity to it, you know, but like, I always want to caution people when they hear the word easy and, and associate that with their walk. Cause I'm like, no, no, it's not. And we right. tell people all the time when they first come to Christ, like here's our phone number, here's our email, because you're it, going to battle. Our, like, here we oh, go. It is about to begin. And, yeah. and that's when the enemy comes even harder. And so it, yeah. And when I say easy, I say, it's, I don't even know what I mean when I say easy, because, yeah. um, it's still hard. Every single day is hard. And, um, just learning to just lay it down at his feet every yeah. single day. Yeah. And there are moments where I'm still a hot mess, but 
<laughs> of course. I mean, we're human. Oh, yes. <laughs> All the Very time. much so. So yeah. Morgan, how can, how can women who are hearing this, or even men that are hearing this and are like, okay, I, I need some help with this. Like, yeah. do you have any service? Are you writing a book or, or how can they connect with you? What, how do you want to help lead people that are going through this into the freedom that you've got to experience? Yeah. So I feel like I'm just beginning that journey of re of having people being able to reach out. Um, I don't have a book. I know I Yet. should. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> Yet I know I that. <laughs> yeah. Trust me, multiple people, and you know the people that are in yes. my life have, you know, told me that I need to. Um, honestly, I think I'm about this close to starting my own podcast. Um, and so I was just talking to a friend this morning. I'm like, I've felt the nudge for so long, and now I'm finally at a point where I feel like I'm ready. And yeah. so right now I don't have anything available for people that they can just listen to or read, but my, and you can reach out to me on my Instagram. That's where yeah. I hang out the most. I'm not really, I'm in Facebook, but not really. Um, but you can DM me and we can start. I've already, I mean, some posts that I put out there, I always say DM me and I always get a few people and I keep in communication with them. Um, so that's probably the best way that they can reach out with me, but it's coming. I'm in a yeah. season of, I just left a season of rest. I spent a month about of just, um, stepping away from the business, like I said earlier, that I was a part of, and now just walking into exactly what God is calling me into. And so, yeah, it's just beginning. So I wish I had more I could give to people at the moment, but they can reach out to me personally. You know, and that's enough, a, a, a genuine response. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and again, I feel like in this industry, it's you got to have this lead magnet, this checklist yeah. and this quiz yeah. nope. to, to bring people in and you just don't, <laughs> yeah. you know, people just like you were saying, they want to feel seen yep. and to know they are seen and, and you are saying you are willing to see them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Cause I, like I said, for a long time, I wasn't seen. So yeah, time to flip the script and let people know that they are seen for sure. Oh, yeah. So good. Okay. We're going to do speed round. Are you ready? Oh gosh. Okay. She's like, what? You did not prepare me for speed round. It's how I roll Morgan. It's exciting. Okay. 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 You ready? You okay. just answer as fast as you can. Okay. I don't know why I'm stretching. Okay. <laughs> tacos or pizza? Oh, tacos. They're so good. They are. Getting like every day. Yeah. Um, what is one place on your bucket list? Oh, um, Montana. Don't know why. why. You don't know why? I don't know why. It's a mount. I I live I live at the ocean, so I want like real. I mean, I've been to Denver. Some yeah. about Montana. Maybe Yellowstone's gotten me the show that I watch. Maybe that's why. Yeah. Okay, maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe so. <laughs> what is your like either go to verse or a favorite scripture, and can be during this season of your life right now? Um, certainly be still. Mm. Like um. It is be, um, I can't even, why am I blanking at the actual verse? It's okay. I, I am terrible with the oh dress. I am too. I, I, I am so bad it. with them. I literally have it tattooed on my leg. <laughs> what in the world? Psalms. Oh my gosh. I'm going to, I'm going to Psalms 46, 10. I can't even, oh my gosh. Look it up people. Look it up. <laughs> and I'm a pastor, Lord heaven. Sorry, Jesus. I can't remember the verse, but be still. Be still. You still yeah. know that God is with you. Yes. Yeah. It's on my oh. leg. Got you. Yeah. It's so good because I love how be still. It means to let go. Yeah. You know, and so many people, and that's we just want to hold on, and we want to like, like you were saying, like I want to get through it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's not even be still of like just stopping and doing everything. It's right. being still so you can hear His voice. Yeah. Like yeah. we have so much crap in our minds in the world that enter and like comes in and. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really hard to be still, yeah. but it's a daily thing. I, I try to do. Yeah. Who's the bigger disciplinarian, you or your husband? Ooh, that would be me. Yep. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. What is, um, one piece of advice that you would give to the woman who right now, uh, desires to be seen? Ooh, speak out. Mm. Oh. Talk, find that one person if it's your husband or a friend or a mom or a dad find that one person to talk to because 
we can you like I said before I held it all in I didn't tell anybody and nobody's gonna know of what I'm going through if I don't talk to somebody so just find that one person that you can talk to don't don't hold it all in oh so good Morgan thank you so much for coming and sharing your story with us I know it's gonna bless so many people all right that's all we have for you today my friends remember the best version of you begins on your next level of faith bye for now